Hello again and welcome to this edition of Nation Building. On our program, we examine the political, social, and moral issues in the leadership of the Bahamas. And on our program today, we have a very interesting, dynamic, and informative guest. And I'll introduce him right after this break. I've been a customer for the past two years, and I will say the quality of the service is very good. During my trip to Andres, I was connected the entire trip. So that was really good. I was able to contact my family members and let them know how the trip was going. We touched land, we're here. So it was very, it was very good. And I really appreciate that. And also during times like when we had the storm, it was really good to have that service to reach out to our loved ones to make sure everyone is okay. And I really appreciate a lot for that. And even when there's a little technical difficulty, they always send out a little text message to let us know if exactly what's going on. I'm happy to be alive and I believe in best. Hello, I'm Wendell Jones and every time I sit down and I watch JCN television, I drink the Jamaica Bahama food juice. It's so pleasing to the palate. I've been cooking Bahamian dishes for generations. I now use Jamaica, Bahamas product. The rice is very fluffy, very tasty, and good eating. Jamaica, Bahama product is simply the best. As an insurance agent, my life is go, go, go. But whenever I need a refreshing break, it's Jamaica, Bahamas Island Mixed Fruit Drink. Mmm, good. Hi, I'm Debbie Barton from GEMS 105.9 FM. The effect that Island Junkanoo Juice Medley has on me is <laughs> exhilarating. Hello. Did you get it? Yes, baby. I got it. Don't come home without it. These arms are mine. They are yearning. Yearning for wanting you. Where is it? Strongback is distributed by Jamaica Bahamas Import and is available at your favorite food or convenience store nationwide. For more information, call 341-4091 in Nassau and 351-8282 in Freeport. Welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. And today um, we're going to have a very, very interesting but informative discussion with someone who has the experience and knowledge to be able to talk to you about any number of issues affecting our country. And I'm speaking, of course, no other than Mr. Shivago Lang, sir. Welcome back to Nation Building. It's good to be here. Wonderful. You've been here so much now, you need to be a staple here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lang, of course, is uh, not just now a former cabinet minister, having served in the Ministry of Finance, as um, he did under the last Ingram administration, but um, Minister of State for Finance, several other ministries that he has served in in previous administrations, but also he is now doing Z Live, a uh, very interesting, dynamic uh, show that is um, on the talks of most people who listen to talk show and, 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 uh, these days. And he is, of course, um, on another network on Guardian Radio. And um, your show on Z Live is between two and four. Two and four, yeah. Two and four. And I believe that as we get ready to start our conversation here, you um, would have heard and is hearing significantly from the uh, people in our country on any number of issues on a daily basis as you talk to to the com to the uh, our, com our people, and so you understand the challenges, the concerns, and the issues that they're facing. And I believe you would have seen both sides of the spectrum now, because you would have also served as a, one of our leaders, but you've also 
Um, I believe in these capacities, people see those of us who have the privilege to, to speak to leaders, political and other leaders, social and spiritual leaders. Uh, people see those of us who have this privilege as their defenders, as people who speak on their behalf to a large extent on any number of issues. And so one of the things that we must do, and we might as well get it out of the way, is just talk about, um, for you to share, what are some of the burning issues that, the main burning issues that you hear on a day-to-day -day basis now on, on, on your show? Hmm. Well, I mean, from my point of view, and it's good to be here, and, uh, and uh, hello to your listening audience. Uh, viewers. <laughs> Your viewers, your, your viewing and listening audience. Absolutely. Yes, uh, you know when you're on radio, you get used to that. I'm a list. I'm, I'm I have a listening audience, but I have a viewership too because we're on uh, Facebook Live. Right, as well. right, absolutely. But um, I would say people are largely concerned in the broad about the extent of uh, the effectiveness of the government that they would have hired about a year ago. I think uh, it was. Uh, overwhelming victory and there was, I imagine, an expectation that things might evolve quicker and much better than they have to date. So there is a broad challenge and concern about the governance of the country. And then if you drill down to some specifics, of course, you know, ban has been an issue uh, in the handling of that matter. Uh, there have been issues um, um, related uh, to uh, a number of pieces of legislation passed, uh, the issues related to, say, the chief justices are not uh, having been substantially appointed as yet. And, and just there's a number of right, particulars. Absolutely. But so, uh, in the broad, I'd say governance. The economy continues to be an issue for lots of people who are unemployed, uh, particularly in islands like Grand Bahama, where, they, where the issue is, is especially uh, stock, and, uh, but the economy uh, as a whole continues to be an issue for people. The, the sense I get is that uh, Nassau, and I could be wrong, I'm not an economist, I'm just making um, this observation, Nassau seems to be holding its own in terms of the, gen the broad economy. Um, Generally speaking, things aren't worsening, would you say? Well, the Bahamian economy is actually uh, uh, picked up. It's, it's, it's picked up. It's growing faster than in times past when the growth was at probably negative to zero percent. So it is growing around one, one and a half percent now. Um, so there are positive signs. That, would have la that largely results from uh, tourism is performing better. Um, U.S. economy uh, is growing um, as well? Uh, well, the U.S. economy is doing better. The quality of it is not as, as we would have uh, seen it in the 90s, and so, but it is better. And so there is a growing segment of the U.S. population that's traveling again, mostly by cruise, but a number are moving by air. And so we are seeing some benefits of that at yeah, the Bahamas and, and those. So tourism is performing better. And uh, I think that is booing us uh, a little bit. It's not at the, the growth of the economy is not at the level yet where it is impacting uh, sharply on uh, employment levels and sharply on wage levels. But, you know, that, that time will, that take, time care will of that. take if we continue to on grow. the trend and if we, in fact, pick up the pace uh, going forward. Nassau is always a kind of, of, uh, different picture because it's the hub of economic activity. So it, and it will get primarily the, the beginnings of any movement upward. Uh, it's the rest of the family islands where that tend to lag, uh, uh, take a little longer time before you see any real It's a trickle movement. down effect yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Now you of course can speak to this um, better than anybody I know. The, when a government is in office, whoever that happens to be at the time when an economy is growing, notwithstanding the growth may not be significant. Uh, true or not true, they get the credit for it. Generally, you're presiding over it, so as a general rule, yeah, you take and credit. And so, almost 12 months in, would you say that the Minnis administration has a right to claim that its policies are helping in this growth? I, I think that any government presiding over an economy at the time it is growing or not growing will 
and can take the benefit or blame uh, for it. To claim that your policies are producing that, uh, that's a different story. Because those of us who study economics, what we are doing is we're looking for the source of the growth. And if the source of the growth is not attached to a policy, then we have to put the source where it is. And At this particular point in time, uh, there is no policy um, initiative that one can, at this point, say is, a, is contributing to the growth. Because mm -hmm. with the tourism growth, uh, uh, a lot of that is Bahama coming on stream. And that's a shared uh, reality in terms of policy. Mostly, though, it would have been uh, the Progressive, the progressive Labour Party. Party administration that saw it through to that the latter days of its, um, its tenure. And then uh, the PF and M would have picked it up in this time. So I, you know, I if I were just being strictly objective about it, I would have to say the PLP wants to take credit for Bahama as a entity it essentially brought on stream, and is, that's now feeding the economy. They should, they have a, they would be justified in doing so. And and these things are kind of weird, and we want to to, to nail down a little further in this because um, you know when, when you listen to the general public talk about successive governments, including administrations that you are a part of and played a significant role, that uh, gets into the blame game for what's not going right, especially probably the first year and a half, two years into their term. Uh, talk about state of the treasury. We had um, Fred Mitchell on. We had um, Wayne Monroe recently, which was highly critical of the government. And I saw it as best as I could as surprise, host to, surprise. To, to, to check him. In, in acknowledging the fact that um, every government seemingly over the last 20 years has latched onto this notion that they met a, a bad economy and, and or the treasury was broke or st the previous administration didn't do such a good job. And so it seemed to me that there's some level of maturity needed in saying, okay, here's the reality. Um, there's always a different administration bring different policy but it can't yeah. be that every time a government takes over the economy, the treasury is broken. Well, 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 but the reality is we have changed governments now every time. For the last 20 years. For the years. last 20 years. So, so each term you could say people weren't satisfied with the governance. And so uh, that's a reality. People weren't satisfied with the governance. But if you want to talk about what actually was the case insofar as the treasury situation, the fiscal situation, the economy is concerned, the, the evidence is right there. The, the numbers are right there. So somebody saying, oh, they left me with a bad economy. Well, you could see the numbers. You could see what the numbers were in the year of the election, and you could see what the number was, numbers were, is, was in the year after the election. You could see what the numbers were in the years before the election, and you could see what the numbers were in the years after the election. So, so there's, there's hard concrete evidence to support and explain what the state of play was in respect of each thing. The problem we have in the Bahamas is that most politicians know that listening and watching souls will not do the research, no, won't take won't. the time to get that information, so they just rely on some who, who gave the strongest argument. or best or most articulate argument about things. And, and, I, and I was going there, so you answered it, because the point is well, well made, which is that um, it's, it's those who sell the case best, just like in a general election. Typically, but, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you this much, you can always see where the lion is if you pay attention to the speech given by the Minister of Finance in the first budget after the election. And explain to our viewers I'll, how that I'll works. tell you what, I'll give you an example of it. When the Progressive Liberal Party came to office in 2012, it said it met a bad economy. And just to be sure, Wayne Monroe on this program last time said, said, so. said that the government, the PLP administration, and he tried to make the point that the current prime minister, who's the leader of your party, the Free National Movement, said, conceded that the, that the, that the, 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 the country was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I took issue with it based on the evidence I had in terms of information. I didn't recall Dr. Minnis saying that, but that's what Wayne Monroe said. But the point I'm making is simply that 
you have opposition parties that get in this habit of saying, as, as Wayne Monroe pointed out, that, oh, even the current leader said that in 2012 okay. we, we met the economy. So, so they argued that the economy was bad prior to election in 2012. When they came to office, they argued that the economy was bad and they didn't know things was as bad as they met it. And then the Minister of Finance in his budget communication projected that the economy be, would be growing about 1.5%. The following year, or that no, same no, year? No, no, the end that year. Okay, okay, okay. Just, just go check his communication. It's right there online. You go to government website. You go to government website, check budget, go on, on budget, then look for budget communications, and then look for budget communications in 2011, 2012. I'm going to see it. Read it for yourself. 2011, 11, 2012, 2012, 12, 13. Well, it would be 2012, 12, 13. 13. That's right. 2012, right, 13. 2012, right. 13. Now go read it just for yourself. You should read 2011, 12, too. <laughs> and so that will put things in perspective. Yeah. But I guess the easy route for most of our politicians is simply to say, but now, to, 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 to not just to bash Wayne Monroe's comment and the PLP's position, but the current administration has basically not used that same argument. It has, it has, it has. It, 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 uh, things were very bad, but to be honest with you, when they said things were really bad in the Treasury, things were really bad. To run a $697 million a deficit in any one year, that, that is, that, that's unfathomable. That's, but Mr. Lang, that's, uh, aren't you, though, being somewhat biased for your party here in this regard? Not at all. The numbers, the numbers speak for themselves. You point to the fact that the numbers speak for themselves. And you said that in 2012, the, the then administration made this, uh, my words, propaganda that, oh, the economy was in a wheelchair. And I'm, I'm making the point that the, this argument has been made for success. But, but you and I are talking about two different things. I didn't speak to the economy. I didn't speak to the economy. Oh, oh the, okay. I was so talking the about the so, treasury yes, situation, so, so, right? So, 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 because, because as it relates to the economy, the minister administration made the same arguments about how bad the economy was. The truth is, if you look at the speech given by the minister of finance, you will find that he was projecting growth to up one point something percent. So, so, doesn't so, that, so doesn't that in effect mean there's hypocrisy on both sides? You call it what you want to call it. I'm saying the two people do the same thing, but the facts can be seen in By their the statements. Records. But on the Treasury issue, right. a $697 million deficit is unfathomable. Okay. You're watching Nation Building. I'm your host today, Mr. Winston Pinnock. And we're here, of course, with the former Minister of State for Finance, Mr. Shivago Lang. We'll be right back after this break. The concierge service is the best thing ever. Like, it is so fabulous, especially for someone like me where I cannot leave my office, my job to go do anything in the middle of the day because I'm on the radio. The service was so fabulous. The ladies gave me a call. They set up an appointment. They come with their professional looking uh, attire. they just so cute. And they come here and it was a great experience. It took 20 minutes to switch over to the Alive service. It was simple. It was easy. And they just made me feel so welcomed. They explained everything. They hooked me up with my new phone. They gave me my data package. As you can see, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was fabulous. It was a wonderful service, but what I really liked best about it was not only did they come here and make it easy for me, but they continued to check up on me. The next day, they made sure that everything was working properly with the phone. I didn't have any issues. The following week, they contacted me again, um, and I've built a relationship with them. They've continued to check up on me. I feel like I'm part of the Alive family. It's amazing. said you can't get great quality products at an affordable price. If you want the best quality food products at the most affordable prices, you must pick up the Jamaica Bahama brand of fine quality products at your favorite food store. Products like Jamaica Bahama coconut water, the most healthy and refreshing drink on the market. Jamaica Bahama fruit punch, the only fruit punch in the Bahamas made from real fruit. Jamaica Bahama coconut milk, green pigeon peas with coconut milk, condensed milk, kidney beans with coconut milk, corned beef, green pigeon peas, mackerel, and corn. Jamaica Bahama's fine line of products is available at all your favorite food stores and convenience stores nationwide. Telephone 351-8282 in Freeport and 341-4091 in Nassau. I don't wanna win.
Hello. Did you get it? Yes, baby. I got it. Don't come home without it. These arms of my life, they are yearning, yearning for wanting you. Where is it? Strongback is distributed by the Jamaica Bahamas Import and is available at your favorite food or convenience store nationwide. For more information, call 341-4091 in Nassau and 351-8282 in Freeport. Welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock, and I'm here today with Mr. Shivago Lang former Minister of State for Finance under the Ingram administration. Mr. Lang, the Grand Bahama economy, talking about economy, has certainly been in a wheelchair, I think, for quite a while. Nobody can debate that. There's no yeah. dispute about that. And yeah. is it not reasonable to say that successive administrations have failed to fix Grand Bahama's problem? Yep, absolutely. Why? Well, I think that for me, it's a combination of things. I think that there wasn't sufficient focus uh, given to it by successive administrations. I think that there wasn't uh, the level of dedication and focus given by the Grand Bahama Port Authority in that regard. And I don't think that the collaboration between the government and the port uh, was there to help the situation much. And then there were a combination of things that damaged that economy that just simply were not easy fixes uh, following Such upon them. Well, the hurricanes uh, uh, really had an impact on some significant uh, economic centers there, mainly, say, the Princess properties, which would have extracted about $30 million in, in wage payments out of that economy. That's an annual figure. Annual figure, and by multiplier, if you use the three-time multiplier, that's a $90 million extraction from that economy. It's just huge. That's, a, that's, like a, that's devastating for an island economy, and there were, were no easy replacements for that. We were not able, as successive administrations, to find a group or groups to come in and make up that slack. Uh, we weren't able to find it because I think the Bahamas' approach to investment promotion is far too static, is far too lacking in, a, in aggression and assertiveness. I think we don't recognize that we need to have a presence in the world 24-7 seeking out capital, and we haven't done that for, for decades. And what specifically should the country, country's leaders now do in, in, in this 24-7 approach to yeah. what you What you want to do is you want, first of all, to have a sense of possible projects you're pursuing that meet and fit with your economic and development strategy. So whether that is a focus on wellness centers for one island, a focus on, uh, on, uh, on entertainment centers for other islands, or a focus on high-end uh, property developments for one set of islands, or agricultural, technology, high-tech agricultural um, projects for another island. Whatever that listing is, you need to go to people with something concrete to discuss. And then you want to have and generate leads uh, in w places where you hear people are seeking to scale up. You hear people are seeking to make an outreach in terms of their investment opportunities. You go and speak with key significant global players and talk to them about what they're doing and try to see whether what they're doing can be married with what you need to have done in your own country. And, 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 and in that process, you are your name is getting out there. People are hearing. I hear the Bahamas is looking for. I hear the Bahamas is interested in doing. And eventually, that inertia will build up to the point where you will get that kind of interest. But I'm told, I'm told that the government actually has a number of very good projects in the pipeline, and that they just need to get out the pipeline. And so perhaps 
uh, some of these projects will be flushed out and uh, they will manifest in some positive activities for the Bahamas. It, it seems as if um, from the sentiment I get, and I don't know what you hear on your show, but it seems as if the public is either too impatient, uh, their expectations were simply too high, or frankly, the government just is not performing. What? What well, well, I think I think the the challenge we have is sometimes we think everything is one or the other. Sometimes things can be a combination of them. I mean, if you are hungry, if you have no job, if you can't pay your bills, you're not impatient. You're desperate. You need something to happen. So, you can call me w impatient, but the truth is, I'm saying to you, the banks are all calling me. I'm saying to you, my landlord, my tenants are all calling me. My, I mean, my landlord. Uh, I'm saying to you, all the bill collectors are calling me, and I and my kids have needs, and I can't meet them. That desperation is an impatience, it's just a desperation. Then there are some people who, they, the truth is, they're against you. And so they, they just see an opportunity where you miss to criticize, and so you can get some of that. But there are instances in which the government has not been as uh, focused or assertive as it needed to be, where it has misstepped. Uh, in some instances, and so you'll have some of that. And then you have, on the other hand, the opposition stoking things, and quite frankly, talking about stuff which, at this particular point in time, they they can't, they really shouldn't, they shouldn't talk about because they have no standing. Okay, let, let's based pick, on their performance. Let's let's pick up on that. What, what, in your opinion, what one of the items that you see as, uh, and I don't want to put the adjective for you, the opposition. Uh, stoking uh, uh, an item that they really ought, should not be An doing. opposition For led example. by Brave Davis should never talk about the, debt, the indebtedness of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas under anybody's tenure in a short period of time. Why so? Because they have no standing, no record on that regard. I mean, that's just a fact of life. He wasn't prime minister. It doesn't matter. That's like saying to me, well, Shivago Lang was in the Ingram administration, but I got blamed for lots of stuff the Ingram administration did. I'm sorry, you were the deputy prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. You take response. I tell you what, everything that's positive, like Bahama, he takes responsibility for. How does that work? How, does, how do you get to pick, cherry pick that, you know what, Bahama, look at what's happening with the economy now because of Bahama. That was us. But, oh, the debt, that wasn't me. You know, I was only the deputy prime minister. No, 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 no. Good leaders don't do that. Okay. So you think it's a bit of hypocrisy there? Well, I'm not, I'm, it's not hypocrisy. I'm saying that if I'm Brave Davis, to be honest with it's you. not wise? I'm, yes, that's right. I'm saying some issues, I'll say, listen, man, you know what? We were not very good on that regard, so we expected better from this crew. That's better than trying to sh express shock that people have this level of indebtedness. When you know... The debt, the borrowing that we were, they've done, the vast majority of that borrowing, borrowing related to things that you left behind. So I wouldn't do that. I would find new things to connect with the society about insofar as their issues are concerned that's isolated from things I could be blamed for. One, one item that came to my attention, certainly, and I've heard a number of members of the public share with me personally, and it's been in the, in the public domain, is the issue of Oban, mm. and uh, um, one, one point that was brought to me no more than on Sunday at a gathering, um, you know, people share, they tell you what to talk, tell us what to sure. talk about sure. on these programs, yeah. this is what, so one, one point that was made to me was, um, at least from, from those who I spoke to then, was they, they, they had great trouble with the fact that um, the Minister Administration, of course, had uh, moved ahead with this Oban deal for Grand Bahama. Uh, $5.5 billion project, and um, frankly, when it was announced, um, great fanfare and excitement, and I think all of us who are from Grand Bahama, like yourself and myself and others, w would w were happy to see that something was in the making. Um, um, further digging in revealed that the, this project was something that was pri previously looked at, and that the PLP had... Um, was considering the project. And so when it was announced and all of the back and forth went on, the person uh, actually said to me, said, you know, I find it interesting that the opposition created the scene in parliament and the, uh, the prime minister, current prime minister, um, got up and basically said, look, I'm, I, I'll, if y'all don't keep quiet on the matter or whatever, he said, I'll reveal why y'all didn't approve it. So I, I, I'm not getting inside all that. I mean, the, the PM can, can speak to those issues and reveal in the public whatever he knows when he sees fit. But 
the point I'm making and the reason I raised it is you, you, you made a point about this practice of not touching some things. Last point the person made to me yesterday was they observed that silence followed the statement from the PM as if to say, well, the opposition was aware that they probably should not have touched it. Well, I mean, the, the Obama affair transcended uh, three administrations, across three administrations. The Ingram administration looked at them not as Oban, but as another grouping then too. When Same the, ownership? Uh, basically, with, when, with, with some LNG component to it. And, and the thought was there, and they were issued a letter uh, approving it in principle subject to uh, clear evidence of funding. And then the Christie administration did essentially the same thing. Why did it, why did it not go further? Under the Ingram administration, because because there no, was not clear funding, no funding. There was no proof of it's, funding. It was clear. It was subject to funding and subject to uh, an EIA, and some parameters were given to the satisfaction of the environmental issues in terms of European standards, American standards, and the like. All of that was incorporated in the letter. I have the letter from the Ingram administration about it. The Christie administration didn't take the same extensive tack, but they did do an approval in principle subject to, I think, clear uh, evidence of funding. And then the, this new administration went further in the actual uh, signing of a heads of agreement. So the, the approach that the opposition took that, well, you know, this is weird, we don't really know anything about it, I mean, that's clearly untrue. So that's untrue. Okay, so, so I think that if the Prime Minister were hinting at anything, it was hinting at the fact that there was sufficient evidence, inclusive of a video that they had sent out, where some of their members had gone and actually viewed the site where the proposed Oban project was to be. Was the opposition really questioning the fact that uh, they had no knowledge of it, or were, were they questioning the fact that there were a number of things, including the EIA studies and other things that... Um, they found issues with. No, my, my own observation was that initially they played coy with the issue, that they weren't really, you know, yeah, they knew it was floating around here, as if this was uh, not something they had taken seriously. When you send, give somebody a letter, even if it has something subject to something, you're taking it seriously. When you go and visit the site with all your ministers and those, you're taking it seriously. So you know a lot more about the matter than, than this just a cursory something that you had looked at. Okay, and, and I think that was a part of the challenge. Ha having said that, for, for those watching and, and having a keen interest in this because it's public knowledge, the, the, why in principle did the Ingram administration, if they didn't provide the, the go ahead for the project and they had concerns, why did the Christie administration have to go back to addressing the issue by then giving another basically a, 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 another go ahead to, to do the same thing that the Ingram administration Well, I suspect for the same reason because uh, uh, what happens is these, these, sometimes these investors use these approvals or these in principle approvals or letters of interest as a means of convincing potential funders, funders that they should come in. And by that time, the letter would have been stale dated. Okay. And so they would have needed a new something. Okay. okay, and that's we're, what that's we're, we're going to pick that up when we come back from this break. You're watching Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock. We'll be right back after this break. I've been a customer for the past two years, and I will say the quality of the service is very good. During my trip to Andres, I was connected the entire trip. So that was really good. I was able to contact my family members and let them know how the trip was going. We touch land, we're here. So it was very, it was very good. And I really appreciate that. And also during times like when we had the storm, it was really good to have that service to reach out to our loved ones to make sure everyone is okay. And I really appreciate a lot for that. And even when there's a little technical difficulty, they always send out a little text message to let us know if exactly what's going on. I'm happy to be alive, and I believe in best. Hello, I'm Wendell Jones, and every time I sit down and I watch JCN television, I drink the Jamaica Bahama food juice. It's so pleasing to the palate. I've been cooking Bahamian dishes for generations. 
I now use Jamaica Bahamas product. The rice is very fluffy, very tasty, and good eaten. Jamaica Bahama product is simply the best. As an insurance agent, my life is go, go, go. But whenever I need a refreshing break, it's Jamaica Bahamas Island Mixed Fruit Drink. Mmm, good. Hi, I'm Debbie Barton from GEMS 105.9 FM. The effect that Island Junkanoo Juice Medley has on me is <laughs> exhilarating. Hello. Did you get it? Yes, baby. I got it. Don't come home without it. Songs of my life. Where is it? Strongback is distributed by the Jamaica Bahamas Import and is available at your favorite food or convenience store nationwide. For more information, call 341-4091 in Nassau and 351-8282 in Freeport. Welcome back to Nation Building. I'm your host, Winston Pinnock, and I'm here today with uh, former Minister of State for Finance, Mr. Shivago Lang, under the Ingram administration. And of course, I'm plugging here. I, when I'm traveling around the world, um, one of the programs that I do tune into um, to keep abreast with what's going on at home is Z Live. I do enjoy your program. Thank you. And um, you know, the, the, the discussion and the feedback, I think, is, is wholesome and healthy for the most part, I think. Um, and there are other programs, of course. Um, but I just thought I'd plug Z Live. I think it is a wholesome um, program on radio. And there are lots of them for the country to tune into these days. Picking back up, uh, Mr. Lang, on the Oban situation before we move on. My last question on that would be, I find it curious that the Ingram administration that you are a part of uh, gave a agreement in principle to the company subject to a number of things. The Christie administration went ahead and did the same thing, and you explained possibly for the company could have been looking for funders and needed to have a current uh, situation to work with as far as them presenting to their funders. Now, the question is, you had another administration, a third administration, the Minis administration. What convinced the Minis administration, you believe, to have d gone further than where the Ingram and Christie administration would have gone with Oban to the point of announcing uh, a, a, a deal um, for Grand Bahama when the EIA hasn't been done and, and uh, I don't know, I guess maybe they had fun proof of funding, I'm not sure, but why would the, after three tries, why would they have been so quick to, to approve? I, I can't answer that question, I, I really can't. I, you but can, can you at least see that viewers would be concerned following the trend yeah. of how this worked? Yeah, I could and, well And ask the question and mm -hmm. some would say out loud, you know, it was, a gov was our government desperate then to make something happen? Was it a premature situation? Well, I can see how viewers might, might think that. Um, I, I don't have the particulars of what uh, the Minister administration looked at when they convinced themselves. I did get uh, from inside sources that they, that they were con persuaded that the funding was in place. I did get that. I also got it from external places attached to the group that they, the funding was in place. To this day, I am not satisfied that this funding is in place, but that's me. I don't have, I'm not privy to the but, same but information let, they let me, have. Let me, let me just quickly jump in here. Why would any administration be allowed to, and I'm not accusing the government of not, uh, not proof, having proof of funding, for sure, but why would any administration be able to go this far in approving a project 
With a, isn't there a Bahamas Investment Authority that is supposed to have but, a but, responsibility? But, but that's, who, that's, who, that's who would have vetted the project and provided uh, input, et cetera, and so they were obviously satisfied. Right, so, I, so I'm saying we, the, the Bahamian people, it's safe to assume that funding was in place. Well, I'm saying that the, those sources said that they were satisfied the funding was in place. The, 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 I think the last thing I'd raise on this, this, this matter is the best commission. It was something recently in, the, in the day, one of the dailies. Uh, I think it was the, don't want to, to misquote him, trust, uh, Bahamas National Trust Executive Director, uh -huh. Eric Carey, uh -huh. that made some statements, and I, I paraphrase here, that there was great silence and even failure to respond to a letter he had written to um, the group to, um, to raise EIA environmental concerns. And I found that very curious because uh, if a government agency is uh, seeking to get information from a potential investor about a project, I thought that's just automatic, that it had to be Well, B B BNT is not a government entity. BNT is actually a non-profit private entity. Um, but in any event, I would have it's thought... It's not partially funded by the government? It's partially funded, but it's right. not a, it's, it's not a government Quasar entity. government. Not even Quasar. Okay. They, you, they'd be, so it's just... They, don't even want, they, would, they would want you to say... Okay, so they're <laughs> they, just getting they funded are actually, by... They actually have, I think they have statutory... Protection. Statutory protection. They have, they have statutory standing, so they have standing in law. Uh, but in any event, uh, that BNT would request information, I would think the government would want to provide it with information. That just makes sense to me, and, uh, and so should Oban. But uh, I think the, the, the Prime Minister acknowledged that there were missteps. Uh, that's polite in respect of how this was handled initially. Uh, but in any event, uh, they, they are, I think they are reeling now from far too many missteps in the beginning of the handling of this. Let, let, let's just, let's just uh, drill down a little bit here. And, and I want to caution because I hear this weekly from, from, from viewers and, and others involved, especially those involved in leadership. Um, they get concerned about information we put out. My only governance is to ensure that I'm responsible and that I act on behalf of the people, the viewers, in providing information to them in a responsible way. Why would a government, any government, any leader, be caught in so many missteps when there is a system, I believe, in, every, in the, the, and we're not talking about a party now that comes to power, we're talking about the, the governance of the country, the structures of government. There is systems in place where you have any number of professionals that provide inf guidance and advice to people like yourselves when you were in office in the current administration and the PLP. Why would there, is it a matter of like we know is happening in many instances in the US where you have leaders or a leader that just dismisses the, the advice of the professionals? or Because this doesn't seem, seem, seem to make sense to the average Well, person. I mean, systems are produced uh, for people and they are managed by people, and people are flawed, okay? Whether you are a prime minister, or you are a judge, or you are Shivago Lang, we are all flawed. Sometimes we make judgments that go contrary to good advice. We make judgments that go contrary to protocols and procedures, and uh, then we suffer the consequences of that. And so why this would have happened? Because somebody made a bad judgment somebody or somebody's made bad judgments and, and the, that, that's the reality. And no system can isolate you from bad judgments. What they tend to do is they tend to try to reduce the extent to which bad judgments can be exercised. Is, does it bring to the point then, if, if this is factual, that you, you, with the current system we operate in, that you, we are, um, exposed as a people to grave errors in terms of what uh, the, the leaders do? You have a country. You have a country run by people. And just like the people who the country's run for, that they have flaws and they make mistakes and bad judgments all day long, and you get to see that manifested in their finances, in their business dealings, in their private lives, etc. then the people you elect who come from among you are subject to the same flaws. And from time to time, if they are, are not 
as careful as they need to be, if they're not as astute as they need to be, if they're not as informed as they need to be, if they're not as competent as they need to be, those flaws will manifest in ways that impact you now. Their mistakes tend to fall on all of us. Yeah, that's my and so question. that's the reason why we try to select people we expect to make better judgments, but I'm saying I'm not going to be alarmed that bad judgments are made. I sometimes are alarmed that that particular bad judgment is made, but I understand that people, whether you are prime minister or you are a judge or you are Cheval Roland, you can be subject to flaws of bad judgments. A, for, a former candidate from your party who was a recent, um, a few weeks ago, uh, appeared on our program, um, raised some eyebrows, um, certainly from the feedback I got when he made mention of a quote, he actually, was, it was a quote that he, he mentioned about, um, you know, the problem with the system of democracy. It is the best form of government uh, for any independent people, but that the, he said, he quoted that the, 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 the form of the, the democracy is built on this premise that we elect people and usually we select the most popular person at any particular time for whatever reasons. And his point was that uh, quite often, the most popular person, to use his direct quote, was uh, sometimes the dumbest. I, and I, I take that to mean that they may not be the smartest, you know, so yeah. without saying anybody is dumb. And isn't that the fundamental problem we have with, with systems of government? I, I don't think so. With democ democratic systems? No, I don't think so. You, don't, I don't, you disagree? I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't, think that, I don't think that that's a fundamental flaw of democracy. I think that democracy's fundamental flaw is that the crowd can get it wrong sometimes, but the crowd can also get correct it right. It. <laughs> yeah, and it correct it. It could correct, but it right. also gets it right. So yes. I just think, I Just I the think, reality of leadership. Yeah. The, recently, something that uh, certainly raised eyebrows in the country and did raise my eyebrow was the um, uh, coming out of a sitting cabinet minister um, in the person of the um, Mr. Johnson, who I believe is the um, minister of state for legal affairs, came out and um, had some words publicly about the prime minister failing to appoint a, a, a chief justice. Um, I tried to grill the progressive liberal party's representative when they came on last time in the person of Wayne Monroe because I wanted to get both sides uh, um, to comment mm -hmm. on it. And his view was that um, big deal, you know, uh, people in cabinet should be allowed to speak to issues that they feel strongly about. And the only, uh, the only um, thing that would, 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 as far as his understanding of, of the rules preventing that uh, is decisions that are cabinet decisions that are made, then you can't comment on them. But outside of that, he feels that it's no problem. Um, as a minister coming out disagreeing publicly with your leader. And so I wanted to, as a member of the Free National Movement, I wanted to, and someone who served at a high level, for you to come in for our viewers to get the other side of, of, of this. Is it, was it appropriate for Mr. Johnson to come out and say the things that he said that's in public domain about the, the Prime Minister's failure to appoint a substantive Chief Justice, pointing to the fact that it can create a scenario where you're holding a critical position hostage, my understanding, uh, in that you, you, you are making decisions are being made, put bef uh, positions are being, uh, cases are being brought before the court daily. And so if the, the point was, if the, if the prime minister is putting you in a position to act as chief justice and doesn't make it, and doesn't go ahead with the appointment, uh, it can very easily be taken that as uh, uh, another leader of another country in Jamaica, Andrew Holness was caught in that, a similar situation where he made comments to the effect that he wanted to see how the Chief Justice was performing before um, making um, permanent appointments. So the, 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 just speak to that, and whether it was proper or not. Elsewhere Johnson is plenty man in my assessment. Plenty man for two reasons. His willingness to say what he wanted to say about it showed a certain uh, uh, depth of conviction and his willingness to apologize for having recognized that he erred in judgment and saying what he said is another something that speaks to his character. He's a plenty man. First of all, let me say that. 
plenty man. He, he, it was not appropriate okay. for him to say what he said in the way that he said it. He, he is one of the prime minister's confidants. So he has many avenues in which to speak to the prime minister about his issues. And he could be more forceful than he was in, in um, the press in those cycles. That a minister has to take that route, that speaks something about the government that we don't want to have to be aired in that way. And you know what I'd ask Mr. Monroe? When him and his client disagree, I want the two of them to come and tell the public. Let the two of them talk and tell us what they disagree about. And, and tell us why that wouldn't happen. There's a reason why you try to keep within a group a certain degree of uni unity, a, a degree of confidentiality. There's a reason for that. So this notion that I don't have that big deal, that shows he lacks an appreciation for why that fundamental tenet exists with respect to how ministers should be, and groups should comport themselves when they are working as a unit. And to his argument that, look, that was not a cabinet decision. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's no different than, I'm saying again, he and his client, he and his partners disagree on a matter. Let but that's them come a private and tell company. No, this is it, it, no, no, but the principle is still the same, though. There is a principle there. Do you want your community to think that you are at odds with each other, or you want to work it through and work it out so that they see you are strong? So to, to, to be clear, this, this position or principle, whatever you call it, uh, of collective responsibility, it is, is it just simply a practice? Uh, it's not a law, right? No, no it's not a law, it's but it a is a, it's a precedent steeped in the uh, governance of, of, of uh, nations that hold to the Westminster system. system. Steeped. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the last point uh, before we and go... See, and see, first of all, Mr. Monroe should also recognize on the day you take your oath, you swear uh, an allegiance and you swear not to disclose your counsel. To the Queen. I mean, you don't disclose your counsel. Well, even the minister was urging the prime minister. What is that? A counsel. Okay. But, but the last, the last uh, question I have for you, sir, today is the, a, a poll came out recently, public domain poll. Uh, and, and the summary of it, without getting into all the numbers, because there's uh, quite a bit to, to look at here, is that there has been a significant decline in the public's uh, uh, confidence in its government, such that some experts are saying never happened in, re in the last 20, 30 years or whatever, however far back, for a government to, or maybe in the history of our country, for a government only 11 months plus into its term to be getting this level of pushback, that you usually have a honeymoon. Um, and I ask, an either or question again, and you may disagree with this approach, but is it that our government is just inadequate and failing so far, and the public has a right to be able to feel, to, to treat the government this harshly, or to judge them this harshly, or is it that as a people, our expectations are simply too high? Well, what I see happening is a combination of things. I see that, first of all, and, 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 and you know, there's a, there's a quote that says, I don't, I don't know which philosopher said it, he said, but the, the point at which we first agree is probably the point at which we first disagreed. Now, let me show you what I mean. Depending on how you read the outcome of the election la last year, if you think you got voted in versus a group getting voted out, depending on how you see that, you may govern a certain way. So here's what I think. <laughs> I think largely the former administration was voted out. And it was less about the attractiveness of the FNM uh, grouping. They benefited from a voting out that in a binary scenario meant they would be voted in. Under those circumstances, recognizing that you were not really endeared, people didn't really, weren't endeared to you, you really weren't the popular, popular, affectionate choice of people, but that they were really ticked off with a group and got rid of them, you needed to give them some very quick wins 
so that they can now become endeared to you. This administration has not done that. So people can't point to a single thing that, well, many, many things that say, wow, look what they did for us. Yeah. Well, they pointed to, people point to the fact that they have arrested any number of, uh, no, they've I, dealt with I, the issue of corruption. I, I, well, if people are pointing to that, then the polls shouldn't reflect, but they reflect it. Let me give you an example of how, what I'm talking about. Hubert Alexander Ingram knew this when he came to office. He didn't assume that they voted for him because he was such a wonderful, beautiful human being. You mean they, in the 92 in 92 election. election, right? He knew that they voted out the PLP, but also they proposed some. So you're suggesting this isn't so, the first time we had a scenario? Oh, okay. almost all administrations get kicked out on the next sure one. I, 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 I would, I would debate that till the cows come. Home. Almost every administration gets voted out, and the next one gets voted in for. That's my observation. I can be wrong, but that's my. The, 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 he decided I needed some quick wins. So the freeing of the airwave, everybody could experience that. Because you could just flick on your channel and know I don't have to just get stuff from ZNS. You change up your, your licensing arrangement, that affects thousands of people, yeah. thousands of people. And so you do things that people can experience and you don't have to explain. What has been true of that so far? Even if you lock up corrupt people per se, if that's alleged, corrupt people, even if you do that, how does that broadly impact me? Satisfaction. Well, it obviously ain't enough. That can only carry you so far. And so I think that some of the low-hanging fruits that they should have picked and could have picked, for instance, if you say you're gonna do term limits, well, go bring the law to the country and there's two term limits. That's only a law. Do you suspect that may not happen? Well, I don't know. I'm just saying, but you could, that's, that would have been a quick win. You, you promised it. You say you want an ombudsman. Bring, bring the law. That's, that's just an ombudsman. So these things become quick, quick, quick wins. I hear you. Mr. Lang, I want to thank you so much My for pleasure. appearing on our program. You always bring a wealth of knowledge and information. And I hope you, the view, viewing audience, uh, certainly would have been uh, well informed and appreciate our presentation today. On behalf of all of us at Nation Building, it's been our pleasure to bring you this broadcast. Stay tuned for next edition of Nation Building. Hello. Did you get it? Yes, baby. I got it. Don't come home without it. Yeah. These arms of mine, they are yearning, yearning for wanting you. Where is it? Strongback is distributed by the Jamaica Bahamas Import and is available at your favorite food or convenience store nationwide. For more information, call 341-4091 in Nassau and 351-8282 in Freeport. Who said you can't get great quality products at an affordable price? If you want the best quality food products at the most affordable prices, you must pick up the Jamaica Bahama brand of fine quality products at your favorite food store. Products like Jamaica Bahama Coconut Water, the most healthy and refreshing drink on the market. Jamaica Bahama Fruit Punch, the only fruit punch in the Bahamas made from real fruit. Jamaica Bahama Coconut Milk, Green Pigeon Peas with Coconut Milk, Condensed Milk, Kidney Beans with Coconut Milk, Corned Beef, Green Pigeon Peas, Mackerel, and Corn. Jamaica Bahamas Fine Line of Products is available at all your favorite food stores and convenience stores nationwide. Telephone 351-8282 in Freeport and 341-4091 in Nassau. I don't want to win. I've been a customer for the past two years and I will say the quality of the service is very good. During my trip to Andres, I was connected the entire trip. 
So that was really good. I was able to contact my family members and let them know how the trip was going. We touch land, we're here. So it was very, it was very good. And I really appreciate that. And also during times like when we had the storm, it was really good to have that service to reach out to our loved ones to make sure everyone is okay. And I really appreciate a lot for that. And even when there's a little technical difficulty, they always send out a little text message to let us know if exactly what's going on. I'm happy to be alive and I believe in best. <laughs>